Hello friends and welcome to Sabbath School Study Hour. I'd like to welcome those who are joining us across the country and around the world, part of our Sabbath School Study Group. Today we have an exciting lesson. We're on lesson number three. We're studying through the book of Mark. But before we get to the lesson, we want to tell you about our free offer for today. It's a book entitled, Why God Said Remember. And this is our free gift. If you, if you would like to receive it, the number to call is 866-788-3966. And you can ask for offer number 185. You can also text SH129 to the number 40544. That again is text SH129 to 40544. You'll be able to receive a digital copy of the book. We hope that you'll read it and then share it with somebody else. You will be blessed. Well, lesson number three in our study today is entitled Controversies. And a key passage of scripture that we'll be looking at is Mark chapter 2, first part of Mark 2, the whole chapter of Mark 2, and the first part of chapter 3. Now we do have a memory text, and our memory verse is Mark chapter 2, verse 27 and 28, familiar words. And he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. Notice the last part of that verse. It says the Son of Man, that's Jesus, is Lord or ruler of the Sabbath. In other words, Jesus defines the Sabbath. Jesus is the one that tells us what is acceptable to do on the Sabbath and what's not acceptable to do on the Sabbath. And that's an important teaching that Jesus was trying to help the Pharisees understand. So we're going to begin on Sunday's lesson, and it's entitled Healing a paralytic. It is a familiar passage of scripture. Mark chapter 2 beginning verse 1. And again he entered Capernaum after some days and it was heard that he was in the house. Immediately many gathered together so there was no longer room to receive them, not even at the door, and he preached the word to them. Now a little history here. If you read in chapter 1 of Mark, you find out that Christ was previously in Capernaum. Now the ancient town of Capernaum, archaeological digs have actually unearthed the foundations of this town. Many of the houses that were there, even at the time of Christ, have been discovered. A large uh, church was also discovered there, or a synagogue I should say, and based upon the dating methods down to the tiling of the floor of this ancient synagogue, it is believed that it dates back to the time of Jesus. Now in chapter 1, you read a story about Jesus in the synagogue and he's teaching and preaching and a demon-possessed person comes in and Jesus casts out the evil spirit. Well then word spreads throughout town. After the service, Jesus then goes to the house of Simon Peter. Peter had a house right there in Capernaum. It was a fishing village. And Jesus was there Sabbath afternoon and after the sun had set, the Bible tells us that people came from all over the town to be healed by Jesus. And Jesus healed them till late into the night. Early the next morning, which would have been Sunday morning, the disciples were looking for Jesus, but he had arisen earlier than them and he had gone out to pray. And when they found Jesus, they said, everyone's looking for you. And Jesus said, but there are many other towns and villages that I need to preach the gospel. And so Jesus began his first Galilean tour. He traveled up to all of those towns and villages. And now in chapter two, Jesus has returned back to Capernaum. He's probably staying in the house of Simon Peter. And so word spreads that Jesus is back in town and people begin to come and they want to hear Jesus preach. And so a crowd gathers at Peter's house and they're standing by the door, by the windows, sitting on the floor, even outside the house. And there is a man that was there in Capernaum that probably had heard about the miracle that Jesus had performed previously in his previous visit to Capernaum. But then Jesus left on his Galilean tour and now he heard that Jesus is back in town and he needed to get to Jesus. And that's verse 3. It says, Then they came to him, bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. So here is a person who lived in Capernaum. He had missed out on the first opportunity to come to Jesus. So now Jesus is back. He wants to get to Jesus. But verse 4 says, They could not come near him because of the crowd. So they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. So here the four men carrying their friend to the house of Peter. And as they get close to the house, they begin to see the problem. There are people crowding all around the house. So when they say, excuse me, we need to get through to Jesus. Well, nobody's going to move lest they lose their space. They're all looking and listening to Jesus. 
Finally, the man realizes the only way he's going to get to Jesus is if he comes down through the roof. Back in Bible times, the houses had flat roofs. And the houses were often used, the roofs of the houses were often used as a storage area. So if this was Peter's house, doubtless up on the roof there were ropes and other things. There were stairs going up on the outside of the house up onto the roof. So the man is carried up onto the roof. Jesus is inside and he's busy teaching. People are gathered around. And while Christ is preaching, you can almost imagine the scene, suddenly there is a noise coming up from above as they begin to open up the opening there. Usually those houses would have an opening in the roof. If they had a fire inside the house, the smoke could escape through the opening. And while Christ is preaching, there's movement and suddenly there's an opening and bits of debris begins to fall down and the children sitting close up to the feet of Jesus, they begin to scoot back and suddenly in the darkness of the house these sharp beams of light penetrate the darkness and everyone's looking up and the hole gets bigger and bigger until finally four faces look down to where Jesus is and then darkness as the man's mat is brought over the opening and probably using some of the ropes that they had found there on the roof they lower the man down to where Jesus is while everyone is silent staring at the scene looking at the man looking at Jesus looking at the man looking at Jesus wondering what's going to happen well, the man doesn't say anything. He just looks at Jesus. And of course, Jesus knows what he really needs. And that's verse 5. When Jesus saw their faith, so that's the faith of the man, as well as his four friends, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. And some of the scribes were sitting there and they reasoned in their hearts. Why does this man speak blasphemies like this? For who can forgive sins but God alone? Now it is true, if any man forgave sins, it would be considered blasphemy. But Jesus was not just another man. He was Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus had the right to forgive sins. Now look at what Jesus says, verse 8. But immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit, of course that's evidence that he was divine, when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they reasoned thus in themselves, he said to them, why do you reason about these things in your hearts? Who can read the heart? but God. Then verse 9, Jesus said, which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, arise, take up your bed and walk. Now from a human perspective, we might think, well, you know, forgiveness, that's something, you know, even we can do to some degree if somebody hurts us and they say, oh, I'm sorry. We can say, oh, that's okay. I forgive you. Now that's not the kind of forgiveness of sins that we're talking about as far as divine forgiveness, but we can say, oh, it's okay. No problem. But for us to perform a miracle and heal someone, well, that's something we cannot do. That's beyond our power. But in the case of Jesus, it was no big thing for him to perform a miracle. There's no limit to the power of God. Jesus could have easily have said, arise, take up your bed and walk. But he asked, what's easier to say, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, arise and walk? Now, what was involved in order for Jesus to provide forgiveness for that paralytic? It wasn't simply Jesus just speaking the words, you are forgiven, because the wages of sin is death. And in order for Jesus to provide forgiveness for that paralytic or forgiveness for anyone, it cost Jesus the sacrifice of himself, for he became sin for us and you know sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. You see, it cost Jesus everything to earn the right to say your sins are forgiven you. That's why Jesus said, what's easier to say? Verse 10, but that you might know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, verse 11, I say unto you, arise, take up your bed and walk. Verse 12, and immediately he arose. He took up the bed and he went out of the presence of them all, so they were all amazed and glorifying God, saying, we never saw anything like this. Now, we still don't have any record of the man speaking. Of course, Jesus first says, son, be of good cheer. Your sins are forgiven you. And then he says to the Pharisees, why do you reason this thing in your heart? And then he says, arise, take up your bed and walk. And the minute Jesus said, arise, take up your bed and walk, the man could have reasoned in his heart and said, well, if he would heal me, I will obey his word. But no. He believed the promise. He believed, believed the word of Jesus. And he put forth an effort at first. When we receive the word of Christ, we need to take it as reality. 
even though we might not be feeling it at the time. But if Jesus says, do this, we need to do it in faith, believing that he'll provide the power when needed. And immediately the paralytic, as he began to try and stretch out those withered arms and try to straighten those withered legs, the supernatural power of God worked upon him and he was completely healed. It was a testimony to the creative power of God in restoring the person, both spiritually and physically. Now, of course, this awakened a bit of a controversy with the religious leaders. You see, the religious leaders lost sight of what really mattered, which was justice, mercy, and humbly walking before God. So obsessed they were in defending their understanding of God, they were blinded to God's working right before their very own eyes. Now, that leads us to our next part of our study, which is on Monday, that builds on the same theme. And you'll see again a controversy with the religious leaders. This is the calling of Levi, and then questions regarding fasting is the next section. Mark chapter 2, beginning verse 13, it says, Then he went out again by sea, and all the multitude came to him, and he taught them. As he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax office. And he said to him, Follow me. So he arose and followed Jesus. Verse 15, now it happened, as he was dining at Levi's house, that many tax collectors and sinners also sat together with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many, and they did follow him. And when the scribes and the Pharisees saw him eating with the tax collectors and the sinners, they said to his disciples, Why is it that he eats with and drinks with the tax collectors and the sinners? Now notice that they put tax collectors in the same category as sinners. Tax collectors back in Bible times, time of Jesus, was very different than tax collectors today. You see, the tax collector was, for the most part, they were Jews who worked for the Romans. And of course, the Jews hated the Romans. They were seen as spies, where they were giving resources to the Roman army to suppress and persecute their own people, the Jews. And not only did the Romans require a certain amount of tax from the Jews, but the tax collectors who were protected by the Romans, they could add on to that tax their administrative fees, so to speak, and they would add whatever amount they wanted, and that was their portion that they would keep. And so they were hated by the people, and yet the people couldn't do anything because they were protected by the Roman soldiers. And here is the tax collector that invites Jesus to come to his house, and Jesus is there eating with him. And of course, the Pharisees are highly offended that he would even have company with someone that they considered a traitor of the people. Verse 17, when Jesus heard it, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Now notice the first thing Jesus notes here is that, yes, Jesus recognizes that the tax collectors and others were sinners. Nevertheless, Jesus said, I have come to bring them to repentance. Where would you expect to find a physician? Well, you'd expect to find him amongst those who are sick. And Jesus, the Savior, came to save sinners. And when he was on the earth, where would you find the Savior? He would be out doing his work of saving sinners. That's the point that Jesus makes. Now, of course, tax collectors in Jesus' day were civil servants under the local or Roman government, as we mentioned. They were unpopular amongst the Jewish population in Judea because they often exacted more than the required and became rich off their fellow countrymen. Mark chapter 2, 18 to 22 picks up a new theme now. It is the central story of these five stories dealing with controversy. Where the previous section included a feast provided by Levi, the next story revolves around the question of fasting. So you're talking about feasting, Jesus is eating with the tax collectors and the sinners, and Jesus said, well, that's my mission. I've come to save the tax collectors and the sinners. Well, then another angle they try is the fasting angle, and we'll see that verse 18. The disciples of John and the Pharisees were fasting, and they came and said to him, why did the disciples of John and the Pharisees of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast. And Jesus said to them, Can the friends of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. Now, of course, in the story here, the friends of the bridegroom would refer to the disciples of Christ. The bridegroom himself is, of course, Jesus. So when Jesus came, 
His disciples were with him. They were learning. They were witnessing the work that Christ was doing. But then Jesus said in verse 19, but the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them and then they will fast in those days. Now there's two parts to that when the bridegroom is taken away. It is first a reference to Christ when he was crucified. He was taken from the disciples. He was in the tomb. But it's also referring to when Jesus ascends on high. There were many times in the early Christian church when persecution came upon the followers of Christ and there was severe a testing of their faith. There was fasting. That'll take place as well. It's taking place throughout Christian history, but that will also take place before the end. There will be a need for fasting. But Jesus says when He is with us, we don't need to fast. When He's with us in person, there won't be fasting in heaven. But in the interim, when He's away, yes, there will be fasting. And then He uses this interesting parallel. He says, no one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment whilst the new piece pulls away from the old and the tear is made worse. He also says, and no one puts new wine into old wineskins or else the new wine bursts the wineskins and the wine is spilled and the wineskins are ruined. But new wine must be put in new wineskins. So two analogies that Jesus uses. He's talking about cloth or clothes and he's talking about wine. Now, of course, if you were putting a patch on a garment, you would make sure that the patch was larger than the garment. If you just had the exact size, there's a possibility that during the wear and tear, the garment would tear away. Now, in the Bible, what does clothes represent? Or represents righteousness. A man-made righteousness can't try and add on to Christ's righteousness. We are saved through His righteousness alone, not by human works. And wine in the Bible, a reference to doctrine or teaching. There's two types of wine. There is pure grape juice, which represents the truths of God's Word. There is intoxicating wine, which represents false doctrine and false teaching. Revelation chapter 17, there's a woman sitting upon a scarlet colored beast, and she has intoxicating wine in her hand. Now, when it talks the new wine, it needs to be put in new wineskins. The wineskins is a reference to the people that receive the doctrine. The new wineskins in this context would be the disciples. The old wineskins would be the religious leaders. So that's the analogy that Jesus was making. Here is an important statement that we have from the book, Faith and Works. There is not a point that needs to be dwelt upon more earnestly, repeated more frequently, or established more firmly in the minds of all than the impossibility of fallen man meriting anything by his own best good works. Salvation is through faith in Jesus Christ alone. Our own works would be that cloth, that patch that we try to add to Christ's righteousness. Our own works, no, it is Christ's, work, Christ's righteousness, His works that save us, not our own. Well, then that brings us to Tuesday's lesson, and we have a controversy revolving the Sabbath, the Lord of the Sabbath. And we pick up the story in verse 23. Now it happened that when He went through the grain fields on the Sabbath, and they went with him, his disciples began to pluck the heads of grain. And the Pharisees said to him, Look, why do they, the disciples, do what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath? So just to get the context, they're walking from one place to another, and as they pass a field, they reach out and they grain, grab a handful of the grain, the wheat, and they rub it together, and they blow away the chaff, and they eat the grain. Something which was very permissible to do. When you traveled, you were allowed to glean from the fields as you went from one place to another. But here, this was a Sabbath, and so they accused Christ's disciples of breaking the Sabbath. Verse 25, But Jesus said, He said to them, Have you never read what David did when he was in need and hungry, and those who were with him? How he went to the house of God in the days of Abathar, the high priest, and he ate the showbread, which was not lawful to eat except for the priests, and also gave some to those who were with him. So this was an emergency situation. If you remember the story, David is fleeing for his life. He's famished. He's weak. And he comes to where the tent was, the tabernacle was. The showbread was just being removed. So David asked for something to eat, and they gave him that showbread. This was an emergency. This is not something that happened every day. Verse 27, And he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. So in this illustration that Jesus gives, going back to history, he says that this is an emergency. It's okay to do those things that are required to do on the Sabbath, especially in the context of saving life or in the context of healing. Mark chapter 3 
It says, And he entered the synagogue again, and a man was there who had a withered hand. So they watched him closely whether he would heal on the Sabbath. So not only is he talking about eating on the Sabbath, but healing. So that they might accuse him. And he said to the man with the withered hand, Step forward. And verse 4, Then he said to them, Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they kept silent. And when he had looked around them, with anger, being grieved by the hardness of their hearts, he said to the man, Stretch out your hand. And he stretched out his hand, and his hand was restored whole as the other. Then the Pharisees, still on the Sabbath, went out immediately, plotted with the Herodians against him how they might destroy him. How ironic. They accused Jesus of breaking the Sabbath because he healed someone on the Sabbath. But then on the same day, they go out and plot his murder. Again, it's the hypocrisy that he's seen. Jesus did not shy away from confronting the religious leaders. He sets up a contrast between good, doing good or doing harm, saving life or killing. The answer to his question is obvious. Doing good and saving life are very appropriate acts to do on the Sabbath, and we want to follow that example. Well, then that brings us to Wednesday. We have our first what we call sandwich story that's in the lesson, and this is beginning in verse 20. Then the multitude came together so that they could not so much as eat bread. In other words, they were so crowded in around Jesus and he was teaching, he didn't even have time to eat. But when his own people heard, his family heard about this, they went out to lay hold of him, for they said, he is out of his mind. So here's the context. Jesus is preaching and teaching and he's doing the will of the Father. And his own family are saying, he's out of his mind. You know, something's wrong. We need to deliver him. We need to take him away. Verse 22, And the scribes came down from Jerusalem, and they said, He has Beelzebub, and by the ruler of the demons, he is casting out the demons. So his family is accusing him, saying he's beside himself. The religious leaders are saying he's demon-possessed. Verse 23, So he called them to himself, and he said to them in parable, How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, it cannot stand. In other words, Jesus is breaking down the kingdom of Satan. How could Satan break down his own kingdom? Verse 25, And if, if a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but has an end. No man can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man, and then he will plunder his goods. In other words, Jesus was plundering the house of Satan. He was breaking down the kingdom of darkness. How could Satan be the one breaking down his own kingdom? Verse 28, Assuredly I say unto you, all sins will be forgiven sons of men, whatever blasphemies they may utter. But he who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is subject to eternal condemnation because he said he has an unclean spirit. So here Jesus touches on what we call the unpardonable sin, or the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. It's not a particular sin, but rather it is the hardening of the heart towards the truth. Jesus came to reveal truth. Jesus came to break down the kingdom of darkness. And when someone resists the truth and rejects Jesus, they are hardening their hearts to sin. There will come a time where that convicting Spirit of God will no longer be heard, and that is the unpardonable sin, the hardening of the heart against God. This passage is the first sandwich story in Mark, where one story is begun and then it's interrupted by another story, with the first story completed only afterwards. The inner story is about the scribes from Jerusalem charging Jesus with being in collusion with the devil. And now we get to our second sandwich story, which is Thursday, and this is verse 31. Then his brothers and mother came, and standing outside, they said unto him, calling to him. And a multitude was sitting around him, and they said to him, Look, your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. But he answered them, saying, Who is my mother or my brothers? Now just remember a little before this, uh, the same folks, the family came, and they said, Jesus is beside himself, he's lost his mind, and they wanted to take him away. So they were kind of supporting the idea that the Pharisees were trying to put out there that Jesus is demon-possessed. Verse 34, it says, And he looked around in the circle at those who sat about him, and he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Verse 35, For whoever does the will of God is my brother, 
my sister and my mother. In other words, Jesus is saying here that those who accept his teaching, who embrace him as their personal savior, they become the children of God. They are citizens of the kingdom. So two interesting things that we see set up here, a strange parallel exists between the outer and the inner stories of the sandwich story. Jesus' own family seems to have a view of him similar to that of the scribes. The family said he is crazy and the scribes said that he's in league with the devil. Many times throughout history, Christians have found themselves uh, alienated from their own relatives. It is a difficult experience. This passage in Mark reveals that Jesus went through the same trouble. He understands what it is to, what it is to be like and can comfort those who feel this often painful isolation. So Jesus was isolated from his family for the truth. And there are many Christians throughout history that have been isolated. Maybe even some who are listening right now. Maybe you have been isolated from your family because of the truth. Jesus speaks words of comfort. He says, you are now part of his family. You are children of God, citizens of the heavenly kingdom. So in our study for today, Mark chapter 2 and 3, we noticed several important principles. First of all, that Jesus can forgive sins. His mission was to forgive sins, not only provide physical healing. Jesus also defines what is acceptable on the Sabbath, what we should do. We should help heal. We should do that which is good on the Sabbath. Uh, the issue of controversy wasn't over which day is the Sabbath. That was clear. But it was whether Jesus and his disciples were going to follow the man-made traditions that the Pharisees had ascribed, or were they going to follow the principles that were found in the law of God, in the Ten Commandments? And then, of course, it ends with comfort and encouragement for those who have been alienated by their family for following Jesus. Words of comfort, words of hope found in our lesson for today that came from the Gospel of Mark. I trust that you've been blessed as we've studied the Word. I want to encourage you to keep tuning in and study the rest of these great lessons covering the book of Mark. Until next time. God bless. Don't forget to request today's life-changing free resource. Not only can you receive this free gift in the mail, you can download a digital copy straight to your computer or mobile device. To get your digital copy of today's free gift, simply text the keyword on your screen to 40544 or visit the web address shown on your screen. And be sure to select the digital download option on the request page. It's now easier than ever for you to study God's Word with amazing facts wherever and whenever you want. And most important, to share it with others.